What's up, guys? I hope you're having a great day. Sabbath is upon us, or coming upon us. Um, I'm here in my work garb. That shows that I'm just a regular Joe, like any one of you guys. I spend almost all my free time reading the Word and putting together teachings for y'all. And it is my joy. It's an honor to do so. And it strengthens me and blesses me. Uh, I've been really busy lately, and that's why I've been bringing you these archived videos. And this is another archived video. This is on, I believe it's Matthew chapter 1, but we go over the similarities in all of the chapter 1s. And I do it in a really um, edited, kind of funny way, so I hope that you enjoy it. I hope that you enjoy the humor. Just keep in mind that even though there's humor there, <laughs> we're talking about some really serious stuff. But when you get to the point where you're always thinking about and always talking about this really serious stuff, you find that you find humor in it because you've given all of your life to God, the formal and the informal, the funny and the not so funny. It all belongs to him, and God does have a wonderful, wonderful sense of humor even when talking about some of the most serious things. Things are starting to slow down for me a little bit, so I think that I'll probably be able to, at some point soon, think about, start bringing you guys some more uh, teachings from right here, right now. This is another video from probably two or three years ago. So excuse the immaturity of 32-year-old Tom. This is 35-year-old Tom. And I am going to be, um, I have put together a really, really cool lesson. And uh, it's just a point of me uh, making the video. Uh, that'll probably not be next week, but the week after that. All right, I hope you enjoy this video. God bless, the Father be with you. The Father, open up your ears so you can hear this word. It is, it is awesome, it is deep, and it is challenging, suggesting that we must submit to him continually and always sacrificing ourselves continually to get closer and closer to him. When you meet him, you're just meeting him. He's very, very deep, and he deserves all of you if you're going to know even that little bit more about him. Hallelujah. Amen. Ooh, also, you get to see me at a drum circle. Hey, remember, he ate with prostitutes and sinners, y'all. What up, peeps? He ate with prostitutes and Green sinners. Scriptures. My heart, a message that I want to, I want to change the world. And I don't have an electric guitar or an amplifier. I don't have a bunch of friends that are excellent at playing music. And I don't have a, control, a controlling production agency to guide my every step to make sure that the world has changed. So I figured I've got a tie, I can put it on my head, it worked for people in the 80s. I thought about putting on a prayer shawl. No one's gonna listen to me if I wear a prayer shawl. Maybe if I just wear it like this. Or how about a yarmulke? What if I'm just wearing a yarmulke? Will that work? Forget all that noise. I'll just cradle a baby. So we're going into the Book of Mark. And we're going to start, actually, because the Book of Mark is kind of long, and uh, the first chapter is kind of long, and we're probably not going to get through the whole first chapter, so I thought we'll read half of it, and half of it's too short. Uh, so we're going to... Here's the prelude. Um... Every one of these Gospels kind of starts out the same. Have you ever gone to talk with somebody who's really important in a, like a worldwide corporation, like a corporation that's running the world? Like if you wanted to go talk to the CEO of Chick-fil-A, do you think you could just waltz into any Chick-fil-A or any Chick-fil-A office and say, hey, I want to talk to the CEO? And they're like, oh yeah, hold on, we'll get him right out. It's not how it works. And believe it or not, God is kind of the same way. You go waltzing into your prayer closet, never having had anything to do with them, 
You say, hey, I want to talk to, you know, the guy who knit reality together right now. They're going to be like, we might show you to the receptionist. There's a waiting area, and you go and you sit down, and the receptionist calls you up, and there's Jesus. Hey, what's up? I heard you want to talk to Dad. Well, let's get you ready. Let's prepare you for talking to him first. What have you done in the past that might make you uncomfortable if you're near him? Yada, yada, yada. And then he might take you to some kind of a, um, a, a boss that isn't quite him yet, you know, and then you go over there and there's Jesus again, a little bit, a little bit more intense. And you keep going and you keep going and you keep going until you get to him. Well, these Gospels are the same way. None of the Gospels is like, hey, check it out. This is what Yeshua was doing. All of them kind of prime you and get you ready for it. This is the way Matthew does it. The book of the genealogy of Yeshua, Mashiach, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then it goes on and speaks about a genealogy. That's more or less the whole first half of that chapter. And then it talks about his birth for the second half of the first chapter. And then it talks about the wise men at his birth. The wise men were not at his birth. Newsflash. Those wise men spent several years, sev well, let's say several months, trying to track him down. He was most likely a walking, talking toddler by the time those wise men showed up in the second chapter, and so on and so forth. In Matthew, we don't even get to him until like halfway through the third chapter, and that's not even like really him. That's baby Jesus in the manger. All right, let's skip forward here. We can take that bookmark out of there. And uh, we're, we're skipping Mark, because we're going to read Mark in a second. Um, We've got Luke here, and as much, oh, this is so cool, this is so cool, this is an Easter egg, and there are actually, there's a few of them in this book, and it talks about the book before it was published. How cool is that? And as much as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things, which are most surely believed among us, just as those who from the beginning who from the beginning, we're going up back to the beginning, were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered uh, them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theopolis. Luke's writing to a guy named Theopolis. His name means lover of God. He's writing this letter to those who love God. And then John... John gets deep. John gets real deep. First it was a genealogy going back to Abraham. Then this guy was talking about, hey, this, that, and the other. There's a lot of people who have been through a lot of stuff to get acquainted with God and to spread this message. So I've been through some stuff too, and well, I'm going to write it down. Here's John, and John just gets straight through the fabric of reality, the reality that we live in, and straight to the kingdom. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So I'm, I stand corrected. John starts with Yeshua, straight up. That's, those are his first words. If you tear apart the word beginning in Hebrew, the word beginning itself is the gospel message. The whole book is summed up in the word beginning. Bar, the son, Aleph, of God, is destroyed by his own hand, willingly, on the cross. He does this with every word, people. Every word. God deals on levels, on levels, and levels, and levels, and they all intertwine and connect in their sub-themes and themes, and they all interconnect, and everything Everything points to Jesus. <laughs> and if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, the first words of Genesis chapter 1 are in the beginning. It's wild. Was the word, and the word was with Elohim? And the word was Elohim. 
He was in the beginning with Elohim. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. And then it goes on and talks about John the Baptist. All of them talk about John the Baptist before Yeshua is brought up by name and, um, and very obviously. This is how Mark does it. The beginning of the gospel of Yeshua Mashiach, the son of Elohim, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of Adonai, prepare the way of Yahweh, make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. That's interesting because a camel is an unclean animal, which isn't a carcass. It's, been, it's, a, it's, a, it's an animal product. It has been processed. He's not eating it. it. has been processed and is now utilizing it as a garment. And then bees are also an unclean animal. But the honey most likely isn't. It could also be that he was eating honey from... Um, from the fruit of a tree. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It came to pass in those days Yeshua came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan and immediately came up from the water he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. If I miss a few words, pardon me. Every time I, I'm looking down, it's all splotchy and blotty from all the lights in my eyes. But I, I don't think I'm missing any words. I hope not. Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness, forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Who else was with the wild beasts for a while? King Nebuchadnezzar. That dude was with the wild beasts for like seven years. His whole kingdom, most powerful position on planet Earth almost ever throughout all centuries. And he's out running around, chewing the cud like an animal. His nails were growing out. His hair was growing like feathers. He t the dude turned into an animal. And, um, and then he admits that God is God. And he gets his position back. And here we have Yeshua. A, not really a young Yeshua, but he hasn't gone into his ministry yet. He's a human being who's not imperfect. However, just like all of us, has a path of righteousness to walk. A process of getting closer and closer to who he truly is so that he can better serve the Father and serve his fellow man just like all of us yet he was sinless now he was going into the wilderness he didn't go into the wilderness for nothing he had some things that he needed to wrestle with out there he needed to figure he needed to figure out more about who the enemy is and how the enemy operates he spent 40 days out there not eating or drinking. Now after John was put in prison, Yeshua came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of Elohim and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of Elohim is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Just doing their everyday stuff. No, no big deal. Then Yeshua said to them, Come after me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets, and they followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them. 
and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. How cool is that? He's got this guy, these these four men there, who are generational fishermen who know how to catch fish. And when Yeshua is up there preaching, he's not casting a hook out and into the crowd. He's throwing a net out into the crowd. The only difference between a fish and a human being is that it's free will that decides whether or not they're brought into the boat or they stay out in the world. It's also free will that decides if you stay in the boat or go out into the world. It's also free will that decides if you get off the boat with him when he gets off the boat, baby, or you stay in the boat and float around out there on your own free will. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, the Sabbath being the seventh day, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Every good and perfect gift, every good lift, comes from the clouds, from him to you. No, Yeshua is the creator of the universe, and he taught with authority. Bro, have you spent any time in the universe? Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Okay, so imagine you are Yeshua, okay? And you come waltzing in to a synagogue, okay? And you start preaching your sermon, and people are impressed. Maybe you were nervous before. I know I've got the message in me, but are they, are they going to accept me? Are they going to throw me off a cliff? Are they going to kick me in the shins and make fun of me? That's going to hurt if they do. Maybe I shouldn't even preach the message at all. What if they just don't accept me? So you guess start gaining some traction. And then some guy in the middle of the crowd screams out, Let us alone! What have we to do with you, Yeshua of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The Holy One of God. Everything was normal right there about a guy who's like, speaking against the preacher, except for I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Yeshua... Got all, he's got all the confidence in the world. He knows who Satan is. He spent 40 days out in the wilderness wrestling with him. He can spot him. He can smell him like a drop of blood in the ocean if he was a shark. And he did not let anything get in his way. He knew what he had to do, and he did it. He doesn't care what other people think of him. He does what he has to do because he cares for them. Yeshua rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately he said, Well, you know, the reason that all this is going on is because I just spent 40 days in the wilderness, and I didn't eat any food, I didn't drink any water, and then when all that was over with, Satan tempted me, and um, I saw some angels. And, you know, now things are different. No. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. If he's ever done something for you and you haven't turned around and done something for him... It could be a reason why you feel some distance between you and him. If he gives you something or does something for you, you don't have to, and you will live the rest of your life like a normal earthling, and there will be, you know, not there will be no issue. Everyone's got issues. But you probably, it's so subtle it's hard to tell. But this woman handles it exactly the way that she's supposed to handle it. Yeshua gives her something, and what does she do with it? She uses it to serve him and others. She is exemplifying the purpose of life in such a beautiful and thankful and gracious way. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. Now at evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and all those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. 
Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Like this video. How humble is that? We're going to pick up with the second half of this in the next video. Well, the next, um, the next, next week. Sorry. Put your two cents in the comments. Okay, and, uh, and we're going to see what he does after this entire day of serving people. What Yeshua does with himself at that point. Share this video with your friends. He doesn't rest. He continues to serve. Thanks for watching, and I appreciate you for being here. See ya.